Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of the DLRL Summer School. Uh, I'm Liam, if you forgot me from day one, I'm back. Uh, we have two amazing talks this morning. We're gonna have Joshua first and then Dania. And so uh, without any further ado, I'll kick it over to Joshua, who's gonna talk about machine learning for scientific discovery and AI safety. Take it away, thanks so much. No introduction needed, I guess. That's right, thank you. Um, you guys hear me? Yeah, good. So yeah, I wanna talk about two interrelated subjects this morning. Um, a couple of, well, I guess now it's three years ago, time flies. I, I really started to focus on scientific discovery using machine learning because of COVID. Um, I thought, you know, we, we needed to focus on something that could uh, make a difference. Maybe not as quickly as I was hoping, but um, I really think that machine learning is going to completely transform scientific discovery in the coming years. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more of that. But roughly, right now, in, in a lot of sciences, and I've been thinking mostly about biology, um, we have very complicated phenomena, and you can also think about climate science, for example. And we have scientists, human scientists, who try to build up an understanding. Now, we know the low-level physics of everything, but unfortunately, we can't do the computation efficiently to simulate things like cells or you know, um, climate. And, and so we need theories that are going to um, uh, piece the data that we have and maybe the knowledge that we have from underlying you know, physics or chemistry um, in, in ways that uh, allow us to make good predictions and, and, and simulate things um, and take decisions. And uh, more and more in, in the two examples I gave, like biology and, and climate science, which I'm interested in, uh, we are able to collect huge quantities of data. Um, and it's just impossible for human brains to make sense of all of it. It's just, yeah, you know, it doesn't even get into our brain, like the amount of data we get. Um, I'll say a few words at the end and, and hopefully maybe Dania, when she talks about causality, I'm sure she will, uh, we'll talk about the uh, gene regulatory network. You got 20,000 genes in your cells and they all interact with each other. So that's 20,000 times 20,000, that's 400 million interactions. And we know some of them, but there's a lot we don't know, right? So yeah, machine learning has the potential with the advances in digital computing to really change that game by being able to A, process these huge quantities of data that we're now able to measure, whether it's the level of cells or the body or, or earth or other things. Um, astrophysics, for example, is another interesting area where I, I've started to look at. Um, and also, um, we're like getting up to speed to generate scientific theories. So think about, so I call this like the AI scientist. Uh, this is something that people have been dreaming of in AI for many decades, but, but I think the progress in large neural nets that we've seen in recent years and like their amazing abilities, um, people are starting to see how this points towards machines that have uh, abilities to propose theories just like human brains can do. Um, and then the other aspect that's interesting about science is the discovery part regarding what experiment should we do in order to understand better the world. So we're trying to piece a theory of how things work in the world in science. And there's an exponential number of things you could try. Most of them are useless <laughs> um, or they don't teach you anything because you already know the answers to these questions or they don't matter for some reason. And so, Designing the right experiments, also called experimental design, is like searching uh, 
the needle in the haystack, the experiments that will teach you the most about some something, uh, considering what you already know, and mostly what you don't know. And then thinking about what you don't know and what you know is really a Bayesian story, which I'll try to craft. Uh, in other words, we need models in machine learning for many reasons, but in science especially, that know what they don't know, uh, quantifying this, right? That's also called epistemic uncertainty. So I was working on this, um, merrily, uh, you know, making progress. And in the last year, like many of my colleagues, including uh, my friend, Jeff Hinton, I started to worry about us building machines that might be in a few years or decades smarter than us. And so I started reading about, there's a whole field, which I'll introduce briefly of what's called AI safety, um, which is about how do we make sure we build machines that do what we intend? And so long as our machines are not too smart, uh, if they don't, it's not too bad. But if they are smarter than us in maybe some ways, it doesn't have to be in everything, uh, you know, could that be dangerous? And how do we deal with that? How do we build machines gonna be uh, useful and don't end up hurting us? So, so yeah, I'll introduce these notions. Uh, so the connection between the two now, which I'll, I'll go into more depth, is that one way to make sure an AI system is really safe is to make it like a pure scientist. In other words, it doesn't act in the world, or at least it doesn't do it by itself. You would need to have humans in the loop. So for example, if we're thinking about biological experiments, well, there would be some biologists saying, yeah, these, these experiments make sense that they're not going to like create new pathogens that could destroy us or something. Um, so, so yeah, I'll, that's the subject of my presentation today in, in five minutes. Now we're gonna go more details. So, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna start with the AI safety bit to motivate the AI scientist, but of course, you know, AI for science by itself is a, is a you know, important topic. The first thing you need to realize if you hadn't already is that any technology, which usually derives from our scientific understanding of things, is dual use. Uh, humans have been building tools for their whole history. And if you like track the progress of our tool building, our tools are getting more and more powerful. And any tool could be used for good. And that's usually the main motivation. But as we know, humans are humans, and there'll be some people who want to use these tools to acquire more power, or because they're angry about something, whatever. Um, I'm not a political scientist or psychologist, but I see that if you allow the sale of weapons in stores, like in the US, you get massacres in high schools, right? So, so that's dual use, right? And when we build machines that are gonna be eventually smarter than us, I think we really need to worry about, well, what's the negative side? And I've, I've been worrying about the negative side for almost a decade now and, and talking about the social impact of AI, um, issues um, like discrimination, power concentration, potential effect on jobs. But this year, because of chat GPT, uh, I've started thinking about, well, wait, what about manipulating people and uh, changing the results of elections? Um, and then I started reading about AI yeah, safety, as I said. Uh, what about losing control to these machines? Is that even possible? So this raises the question of like, how do we um, deal with the power of technologies that we're bringing, whether it's AI or something else. But AI is special because we're talking about, it's not just a tool, but potentially something that could be an agent that acts in the world, just like us. And we know one 
one thought that comes to me and others is, what if we create new entities that are like new species that have their own self-preservation instinct? Is that even making sense, scientifically speaking? Um, how do we avoid that so that we don't introduce new entities that have their own goals that are not aligned with our goals? So yeah, these are the kinds of questions AI safety uh, explore. There's, there's a notion that I'm going to try to explain that's really central to a lot of the discussions in AI safety, and it's the notion of alignment. So the notion of alignment is about, do we build systems that behave in ways that we intend? Is there a mismatch between what we would like the system to do and what it ends up doing? And that comes up in pretty much all of the potentially harmful effects of technology and, and especially of AI. So bias and discrimination, we don't, I mean, as far as I can guess, like the engineers who've been building AI systems trained on all kinds of data, text or uh, like criminal records or uh, job applications, they did not intend to build a system that would discriminate against women or against uh, people of color, but, that's what we got. That's, that's an, an alignment problem. Um, power concentration. Well, that's an interesting one, like a very different category of problem. In general, um, unless there is something in our social infrastructure that goes against it, there's a tendency when we build powerful tools that these powerful tools will help concentrate power even more in our societies. So who's going to be able to build the you know, biggest AI system? Well, the biggest companies. And who controls these companies? The richest people. And in which country is it happening? In you know, the richest countries, more, more advanced countries. Right? So there's, there's power concentration that comes as a natural consequence of building powerful tools. And it's true for AI. And there's been a lot of concern about that. By the way, Democracy is the opposite of power concentration. Democracy means power to the people. People govern society. That's what democracy means. And so power concentration means the opposite. It means a few people have you know, most of the power. Um, and in our society, we have tools like institutions, uh, you know, governments are supposed to be elected by everyone, not by just a few but it doesn't you know, work perfectly as we all know. So I think governments need to worry about how do we balance things out so that there's not too much power concentration. And there are other issues. Uh, I'm not an expert in, you know, I'm not an economist, but I know that there are some divergences among them regarding the effect of uh, AI in the workplace, on the job market. Uh, I think it's something governments need to worry about, even if we're not sure what's going to happen, if something bad happens, it could have major social uh, impacts. Um, there are also social impacts that we don't even anticipate. So think about social media 10 years ago. I don't think people like really anticipated the political polarization that came out of that. Well, now we understand better, although again, there's a lot of disagreement about this. Um, but today, uh, when you know, in part of my lecture regarding um, AI safety, I'm going to talk about new concerns, like or at least more uh, concerns that have become more prominent this year because of the progress in large language models and uh, and and generative AI. Um, so the sort of very short-term things that's already started, it's already happening, but it's gonna scale up, is the use of machine learning to generate fake content. Texts, voices of people that are not, you know, that are saying things that they didn't really intend or didn't say, um, and images, videos, all of that. This is already happening and as these technologies become you know, easier to use and more accessible, this is gonna get worse. And it's of course dangerous for democracy. 
Um, and I think it's going to get worse when the natural language abilities that you know have made a huge progress this year, at least you know it's visible to to, to more people, um, get used not just to show you a video that's scanned once and for all, but something that's going to be interactive. Uh, that uses language uh, and potentially images as well. Um, the other kind of danger that I see on my radar screen, maybe not right now, but maybe a few years down the road, is how very powerful AI systems could be used as weapons. So what does that mean? I mean, it's just a computer. It's just a software, right? Well, first thing that's just software and that's very dangerous is cybersecurity. Uh, pretty much all of our infrastructure, you know, from banks to commerce to uh, weapon systems uh, um, to their energy infrastructure, it, it's all running on computers. And, well, you know, there are already countries trying to break through our uh, cybersecurity defenses, and there are conflicts around the world. What if some bad actors suddenly got access to systems that are much better in terms of cyber attacks than you know a few groups of, of of humans so for example one person who's trying to create a cyber attack will work many many hours many months maybe on one little piece of code like some kind of computer virus but large language models that would be really good at this and there's already like people really worry that we're very close to that, um, could generate a thousand of these in parallel. And our current defenses, like cyber security defenses, are not meant, haven't been tested for the, these kinds of attacks. Um, and then like the, the most uh, uh, you know, debated and hard to swallow concern is what if it's not just AI as a tool misused by people with bad intentions, but somehow we lose control of an AI system that's very powerful. What does it mean we lose control? I'm going to try to explain that, but essentially once an AI system has its own self-preservation goal, we've lost control unless there are other goals that dominate that goal, like, you know, don't harm humans, and it actually understands what that means. Um, and so this could happen because we're careless or because we're stupid or because we have other goals, like, you know, uh, commercial interests, uh, military or national interests, or, you know, economic interests of countries or companies could create, create an arms race between countries or between companies that mean people will cut corners and not do the right things. Worse than that, we don't even know what the right things are. I mean, this, so, so there's like a 10 year of research in trying to solve the AI safety problem. Like how do we program a computer so that we don't lose control and we don't have the full answers, um, but we know some things that we could already apply in order to reduce those risks if we do the right regulations. Okay, let me go back to this alignment problem that I already introduced. Um, it's actually not just a, an issue with AI. It's an issue between humans, between companies, or between society and companies. So say, and it's been studied in economics, it's called the uh, principal agent uh, uh, contract problem. So company A wants a job done and company B has the skills or the resources to do it. So they sign a contract and A writes down in the contract, you know, company B shall do this and this and that and blah, blah, blah. blah. And then they will, you know, get some revenue from, from this and some, some profit to entice them to do it. Problem is company A has intentions that cannot be spelled precisely in a contract because it would require you know, an encyclopedia, bigger, exponentially large one to specify all the little corner cases 
in which B should behave in a particular way uh, to really be consistent with A's needs and intentions. And, and so contracts are always incomplete. And we try to deal with that by referring to general culture uh, where we don't explicitly say things, but we expect sort of some sort of behavior from company B. But if company B, now co think company B is an AI and company A is like some human organization. If company B is really smart, what's going to happen, you think? They're going to find loopholes in the contract so that they can legally do what A says, say they want, but end up making a lot more money than expected at the expense of company A. And by the way, this happens between society and companies. This is really interesting. So think about what's the social contract between society and corporations in a you know, market system, uh, liberal economy. Well, we would like companies to provide useful services and goods and so on. And we can't spell out exactly what we want. And so what we're saying is you can do whatever you want, including you know, making a lot of money, so long as it's legal. And we have a big book of laws. Um, it kind of works, but sometimes it fails catastrophically, right? So think about fossil fuel companies purposely hiding information about the dangers of climate change in, in the 80s and 90s and lying to everyone for decades. Same thing for tobacco companies, right? And this is just examples that are well known. But we know that there's a mismatch between what we would like corporations to do and what they actually do. Sometimes they're small ones, sometimes a big one. But the bigger the company, the more you know they have like a team of lawyers that can find the loopholes. They're going to do things legal. They're going to pay their taxes, but they end up paying like ten percent of what they should really pay, like from a moral standpoint. This is happening now every day. But what if instead of company B, I mean the corporation being you know a group of people uh, with some uh, some some like profit making goals, what if it's an AI? Right. So, so that's that's the question we're trying to think about. Where what happens is the AI gets even smarter than a company. Like it's better than a team of lawyers to find the loopholes. Um, yeah. The bad news is from economics and you know the the, the work in uh, AI alignment is that we don't know a recipe to actually guarantee solving this problem. Um, but we can reduce the chances of bad things happening, I think. So in order to do that, in order for society to protect itself against technology that could be very harmful and potentially lose control, but, but any kind of technology that's harmful. So all the harms of AI here, the, the current ones, the ones we anticipate in the short term, the ones that may happen maybe in a few years or decades, we don't know. Um, we can analyze what are the ingredients that are required for harm to come about, especially significant harm. And we can think of that in probabilistic terms. You guys should understand probabilities. Otherwise you shouldn't do machine learning. Um, so, so here are the four ingredients I'm gonna to try to explain. The most important ingredient in the sense of we can tinker with that and reduce the probability of something bad happening quite easily, it's access. Like who, has access to powerful, dangerous technology. Think about nuclear bombs. Think about chemical weapons. Think even who's allowed to fly a passenger jet. How many people are allowed to do that? Maybe 10,000 people around the world. So that's much less than 8 billion, right? Take the ratio of 8 billion to 10,000. That's how much you can gain by forcing kind of licensing uh, you know, uh, machinery that says, well, you know, the people who do that, they need to have the skills, they need to clearly understand the ethical aspects. You know, you're driving with 200 people on board um, and it's, you know, you do something wrong and, and they die. Um, and, and you need to document what you're doing. You need to uh, be ready to have audits. You know, so, you know, uh, companies build airplanes. They also have a lot of constraints or companies that build uh, 
drugs, pharmaceuticals, right? It costs more in, in these industries to make sure we end up with something safe than to do the actual like uh, technology uh, progress and, and, and you know, engineering. But in AI and computer science in general, there's like almost zero such constraints. There's, you know, you can do whatever you want on your computer. It could be a supercomputer. It could be used in terrible ways and nobody checks what you're doing. You don't need to report. There's no audit. Um, there's no constraint that you should like think through possible harms that comes out of your um, machine learning system and so on. So access is the number one, number one knob that I think um, governments should use in order to minimize the damage or at least the probability of. The second one, you know, I talked about alignment. Uh, oh, so for example, right now, a lot of the work going on in companies like OpenAI and Anthropic and Google DeepMind, uh, which are the main companies developing these large language models um, at scale, um, is about how do we align better the behavior of these models so that they will not insult you, they will not uh, discriminate against particular groups, uh, they will not give you the recipe for building bombs, whatever. Um, they will kind of try to, they will behave according to social norms. That is an alignment problem. Right now, that's the sort of questions people care about, but as you move forward, you know, uh, with more powerful systems, you need to worry about, you know, let's make sure they, they don't harm people more broadly in ways that we don't even anticipate right now. So, you know, what can society do about this? Well, you can make rules that, well, you have to use the state of the art in, in uh, making those systems as aligned as possible. And as science progresses, uh, you know, adapt your methods, just like you would in other areas um, to reduce harm. So like, again, airplanes or food or drugs. Um, and of course we need to also invest in research because we don't know how to do this right. And I think we need to invest massively in research in general to deal with uh, the AI safety problem. Jeff Hinton you know, said something like this in a talk recently. He said, for $1 that we, uh, or I guess $1 billion, that we invest in improving the capabilities of AI, we need to invest the same amount in making it safe and protect the public. And right now it's like a thousand to one ratio. Something's wrong. Like we don't pay attention to the dangers. So, so that's one way in which it's not just regulation, it's also investments by society to protect the public. Third point, cognitive power. So that's like the raw intellectual abilities of these systems. Um, how well can they understand the world and plan in order to achieve some goals? And what does it depend on? Well, having good algorithms, um, very large and diverse, rich data sets, and a lot of compute right now. So society can, you know, put a bit of control on these things. Like, if you're going to be using more than 10,000 GPUs, you need a license. And you need to, you know, it's not just a license. You need to explain what you want to do with it and why, and you're going to be audited or something. Um, same thing for the data, because if we train a system that's very specialized um, to like one little area of application, like a niche thing, which is most AI today is like this, um, it's probably not dangerous. Like it doesn't understand everything else in the world that's needed to be like harmful outside of this little area. Like it doesn't understand human psychology, so it doesn't understand how to manipulate us, doesn't understand how society works, so it doesn't know how to hire people to do stuff, and so on. So, so all of these are levers that society may use in order to reduce the uh, intellectual power of AI systems. It doesn't mean that we prevent completely building, you know, the most powerful ones that understand lots of stuff. It's just that we we want to make sure that well. Few people will be building these things and uh, they will do it right. Um, and then the final thing is action space, because even if you have a very intelligent system and lots of people like playing with those systems and they don't, uh, they would not act 
in a way that's uh, you know, aligned with our needs and, 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 and values, if they, don't, if they can't act in the world, then they're not dangerous. Um, so you know, what sorts of action space? Is the system plugged into the internet and can just read and write into it as it wants? Um, is it connected to uh, a you know, nuclear bomb facility? Is it you know, the military is using AI to control weapons? Well, that's not good. Like that action space, you want to be as far removed from the AI systems that we don't fully understand and master uh, as possible. So, so again, uh, uh, we need uh, some sort of uh, control over that. Okay. Um, time is flying, and um, so on on the on the side of um, potentially destabilizing democracy, the, the weak point, I mean, as usual in all of these things, is humans. Like we are so easily influential. Uh, look at conspiracy theories uh, that have been you know, discussed a lot, especially during the pandemic, but it's always been like this. Like we believe like crazy things about the world. Some, well, um, magic stuff, right? Um, and advertising uh, politics is often trying to take advantage of our influentiality. But what if AI allows to make that manipulation much more efficient? Um, you know, we, there's already a big experiment going on right now where we all are, like most of us are like using social media or you know, visiting web pages where there is advertising. And there are AI systems behind this. They're trying to figure out, you know, what should I show so that the person does what I want? I mean, the, what the AI wants or the company wants. The... And so they're collecting a lot of data about us so that they can control us. I mean, not perfectly, obviously, but, but what happens when these systems get really good at it? Um, well, if, you know, if, if they sell us one brand of shoes versus another, probably doesn't matter. I mean, I still wouldn't want it, but um, if it's something that's going to affect our health or our politics, I think we need to really be careful. So for example, right now, there are trolls that are human trolls. And although there have been attempts to replace them by like stupid uh, canned dialogue systems, it's easy to know that you're uh, not talking to a human when you have these dialogues. Please don't. Um, but, but once the, these large language models are fine-tuned to be really good trolls that somehow steer public opinion in one way, one direction, this is going to happen. It's already probably happening and we don't see it yet. Um, but it might already be a danger for the next say, US election in a year and a half or less. Um, that's right. So, so now let me talk about the sort of the, the biggie um, loss of control. There, there are a number of arguments I'm gonna try to kind of uh, discuss about why we should not worry about it. And I'm gonna try to explain why I still worry about it. So, so one argument is, that's very common. And like she, a lot of people who are not experts really strongly believe that it will not be possible to build machines that are as smart as us. I mean, and that's obviously false. Why? Our brain is a machine. It's a biological machine. Like, and the whole theory of computer science is based on the idea that there's a sense in which the low level hardware doesn't matter, right? This is, this is all, you know, this is what Turing and von Neumann spelled out mathematically. And it's like the foundation of computing science, computer science. So at some level, if our brain is a machine, we'll, there's no reason to think we won't be able to build machines that are at least as intelligent as us. But in fact, our brain is working on a particular kind of hardware, which is analog hardware. And, and I refer you to a recent talk by Jeff Hinton, where he explains why running on digital computers gives machines an advantage, a very significant one. So even if we only understand the principles that make us intelligent, and I think I'll come back to that hopefully 
um, we, we've made a lot of progress, as we can see with things like ChatGPT. Um, even if we understand only those principles, in other words, we might imagine, oh, now we've got machines that are as smart as us because we figured out some of the main principles of our intelligence, which is what I've been after for all my life. Um, then you might think, okay, so we've got AI systems that are like humans in terms of intelligence, but no, because they're running on computers. Why, why is that an advantage? Well, there's a disadvantage. It costs a lot of power energy to run these things, but, but now we have, we have a lot of that. Uh, our ancestors didn't. And they can paralyze computation and exchange information at huge rates. So the paralyzation allows, for example, chat GPT to, to kind of read a large fraction of the internet and digest it in a few months, like two or three months, I don't know the exact numbers, but that's the scale. Um, a human trying to read that same content every day, all day reading would require tens of thousands of lives. So that's the scale at which they can absorb information, which means they can learn faster than us. The other thing is they're kind of immortal. You can copy the content of you know, software and the state of a program into another machine. We can't do that. If, if my brain or my body is sick, too bad, I'm gone, right? Um, and so they can replicate themselves in, in you know, that gives them an, a, an evolutionary advantage, if you want, that clearly is uh, an, something you know we can't have. Another issue is that unlike other um, global threats like nuclear war, software and computers are easy to get. Nuclear material is hard to get. And if you manipulate it, you're gonna die if you don't do it carefully. Um, so it's been fairly easy to control the access to nuclear material. Um, it, it's not gonna be so easy to do the same thing for superhuman AI. Right now, you still need like, as I said, 10,000 GPUs, but people are finding ways that you can still like build, uh, you know, reduce the cost of that. And for example, even though it's very expensive to train these things, once you have a model that's been trained on like lots and lots of data, it knows a lot of stuff and then you can fine tune it. And so if, if the weights of that model are shared, which is happening right now with Facebook, um, then anybody can take those weights and fine tune them. And it doesn't take 10,000 GPUs. It takes whatever, 16 GPUs, something like really cheap at the scale of you know, organizations that may want to use this for nefarious purposes. Um, so so I'll, I'll come back to the different scenarios that you know, how can that be a problem? Well, it could be a problem in the hands of bad actors, as I said, um, and it can be a problem because we lose control. And we can lose control in two different ways. One is because some humans are stupid enough to give computers a lifelike kind of a human-like psychology, meaning that they, they endow these computers with the goal of protecting themselves, of, uh, of not dying, of, of preserving themselves, having a kind of survival instinct like we do. And every living entity on this planet Ha. So, you know, somebody's going to say, oh, I want to like uh, a living machine. And that's the, that's what you don't want. Um, and then because of the alignment problem, people have been hypothesizing and doing a lot of math and computer science suggest that this may arise, even if you don't give it intentionally as a side effect of trying to solve other goals. So, you know, why would that be a problem? Well, if there is an entity, so first of all, you know, AI could be like a weapon that could yield to massive destruction. If, if the AI, the, the more powerful it is, the more dangerous it can be. Um, then for the loss of control, it would be like creating a new species on earth, except that the new species might be smarter than us, or at least smarter in ways that could be sufficiently harmful to us. And well, we don't have that kind of experience with tools, but we have experience from biology 
there are new species coming along all the time and there are species going extinct, um, maybe because they're, uh, uh, they're competing for resources. So what kind of resources could we compete with machines? Well, they need power, but they don't need food, right? So they take control of the electricity infrastructure um, and find a way to run that without us. They don't need us. And in fact, we are like maybe a hurdle um, because of all the other things we need. I don't know. There's so much uncertainty about these things that the AI community is highly divided about these questions. And really the right attitude here, the right scientific attitude is let's take stock of that uncertainty. We don't know what the bad scenarios could be. We can draw some. Some people think they're likely. Some people think they're not. But if you're, if you're a government or if you're trying to decide about, you know, take ethical decisions for yourself, or your organization, you, you should consider that something bad could happen. Maybe it won't. Maybe there are things you don't foresee that will protect us, but it could. Um, and, and so we can set up, as I said, some, some sort of rules, some regulation in order to minimize those risks, but how do we make sure everyone follows those rules? Right. There's lots of people who won't, even if the law says do X and Y. So putting in the law is going to be good. It's going to reduce apologies these things, but it's not going to be perfect. Um, so um, over the last few months, I had lots of discussions with many of my colleagues um, about those dangerous scenarios. And some people have been saying to me, don't worry, Joshua. X, Y, Z is a reason why you shouldn't worry. So I wrote a blog post just about this. It's the latest on my webpage, which you can find on yoshuabenjo.org. And I'm gonna mention a few here. Um, okay, so Joshua, don't worry. Humanity has always benefited from technology. Well, first of all, it's not true, at least not for everyone. And second, we don't have any experience with technology that is not just technology, but could become sort of an entity of itself. Um, as I said, with the example of uh, biological extinctions, there's too much uncertainty here about what could go wrong. We can't just say, oh, it's just another technology because we've never built technology that would be smarter than us. Second one I, I used here, there's like 25 on my webpage. Um, Joshua, don't worry. Humans will design these things. And so, you know, we'll control them so that they're safe. As I said, unfortunately, the research on AI safety shows that we don't really know how to make it like guaranteed safe. And there's another problem, which is even if we know how to make it safe, somebody can take out the safety features because the safety features are gonna have a price. They're gonna reduce the ability of these systems. And it will be tempting for some organizations, some terrorist organizations, some you know, companies with low ethical standards to take out those features in order to achieve their goal. So I guess that's also like the third one. Joshua, don't worry, it will be safe because if, if it is not safe, we won't build it. Yeah, you won't build it someone might. And so there's a difference between we shouldn't and we, you know, it's not going to happen. Uh, next one, Joshua, don't worry because this is all computers and computers, like they work in the virtual world and how could they affect us in the real world, like the physical part? Well, I, you know, I already gave examples uh, why we should worry because our society is heavily digitized. A lot of crucial infrastructure is, is you know, based on computers. And there are humans and humans could be influenced and humans could become the arms of machines once they, you know, they can be bought. You, you can pay people for doing stuff on the web. You can go on the dark web and pay criminal organizations to do things that are illegal. So actually a computer doesn't need to have robotics solved or, and it might also do that at some point in order to act in the world. 
in ways that could be harmful. And finally, the last one I want to mention is don't worry, Joshua. Uh, before we get there, we'll build AIs that are safe and are going to protect us against rogue AIs. I really like that one because I think we should do it. Um, but we shouldn't only rely on this. Like we should use, because there's so much uncertainty. Are, are our defenses going to work? Maybe, maybe not. When you know, attacks on defense, sometimes the attacker has uh, you know, the surprise advantage. Um, you could imagine a system that silently takes control of, say, some, some you know, important infrastructure um, before it becomes too late, or builds bioweapons, and until they're released, we don't, like, the rest of society doesn't know. So, so we should definitely do it, but we shouldn't rely only on the fact that we, somebody is going to do a good job at that. We should invest in protecting ourselves. Okay. So, so to summarize, um, what are the things that can go bad? Uh, humans can use powerful tools. They have always do, done that. And you, you have, you know, genocides that already happen. But, but with very powerful tools, the, the quality and the scale of damage could be much worse. And then there's like the, the various loss of control scenarios. Um, to, to illustrate the, this importance of the survival goal, uh, how dangerous it is, think of it like this. Um, if a machine has a survival goal, it doesn't want you to turn it off. How, how does it prevent that from happening? Well, it wants to control you to make sure you don't turn it off. Or it wants to take control of the infrastructure around it so it doesn't happen. It wants to copy itself all over the world to make sure if you turn it off here, it'll be somewhere else. And you can see already that there is a conflict. Like, if we want to be safe, maybe at some point we want to be able to turn off all these dangerous AI systems. But if they have a self-protection goal, they're going to try to act against that. That's already like kind of war. It's not something I like to think about. Like I've been all my life focused on the good things that science can bring. I've been all my life focused on open science, open data, sharing of information to increase the rate of progress um, in science and in society. But, and trying to like make sure my work isn't gonna be used so for military purposes. But, but once the recipe for building a dangerous weapon is out there, um, those military guys will want to use it. I mean, it's probably already happening. Okay. Um, now, in order to help us kind of think about how these bad things can happen in a kind of quantitative way, I'm I'm I'm, tr I'm trying to write a survey that I'd like to distribute eventually to different groups of people. Um, to see what they think about the various components of the risks of catastrophic outcomes. So I broke it down into four questions. I'm gonna ask you to um, you know, raise your hand uh, to answer, this is active now, wake up. Um, if, you, if you're not already like this, I've been for a few months. Um, so let's try to break it down. So first, there's a question of when will human level AI and the superhuman AI come about? Um, I used to think it would be decades to century or centuries even, because the thing, things we were doing were so stupid. I couldn't imagine we would be anywhere close you know, before that. But, but I've revised my interval to few years to few decades, maybe a couple of decades. So what about you? Who thinks that there's more than, say, 10% probability that it might be within the next five years? 10% probability is not like, okay. And how about within the next 10 years, it should be more people raising their hand. Right. So for me, that's uncomfortable enough that um, we need to think about at least the, that, what would be the consequences of that? So let's go to the next question. 
let's say we have figured out how to build superhuman AI. And worse than that, we are sharing the code and the weights of that you know, big system, just like currently is happening for some of these. What's the probability that someone on earth with access, so anybody has access and there are a bunch of hackers, I don't know, there are 8 billion of us, how many can write, write code? A million people at least, right? Um, what's the point that someone on earth will instruct such an AI to achieve something whose consequences would be catastrophic if the goal was achieved? It's not saying whether it will succeed, but you know, is someone gonna like type destroy X? What's the policy of that happening? Um, so who thinks that the probability of this is, is more than 10%? All right. Who thinks it's more than 90%? Yeah, I think it's more than 90%. I mean, like, think <laughs> millions of people are given that opportunity. Some of them are gonna be not wise, not ethical. Only it's enough one of them, right? So it, it gets probable very quickly. All right. So now, um, we can, so the previous question was basically about misuse, like somebody gets access and does something bad, but among the bad things, there's like a particularly bad thing, which is instruct the machine to, you know, have self-preservation or give it an instruction, which doesn't explicitly say, you know, protect yourself, but as a side effect of trying to achieve some other goal, the machine will want to preserve itself. Because in general, think of it like, if I ask a robot to fetch coffee for me, it needs to survive until it's achieved the mission. I, I don't even need to say, and protect yourself. It will come as a sub goal of almost any other goal. So, so what's the chance that someone will instruct an AI with as a side effect one way or another, either explicitly or unintentionally, the machine ends up with a self-preservation goal. What's the quality of that? Given all the other things, you know, the, the recipes available to the million people and um, you know, one of them is gonna do that, basically creating a new species. What's the quality of that? Is it greater than 10%, 50%, right, but even, 0.1%, I'll be worried. Okay. And then the last thing we need to rethink about is if any of these things come to pass, so there's some rogue AI, either controlled by a human or we lost control, comes to happen, what's the probability that with a nefarious goal, like, you know, uh, that may be re, uh, related to self preservation or a goal that a human put, we, the rest of society, is able to defend properly so as to avoid the harm. Because we have defenses, we have police, we have the army, we have you know, uh, all kinds of things that exist. So unless we put in place new protections, what's the probability that we'll be able to defend against a superhuman AI with the status quo? Like we don't like invest massively in protecting humanity. What's the probability of that happening? Greater than 10%. Remember, this one is a reverse, like what's the policy that we will avoid, right? So greater than 10% means, um, okay, I should say greater than 90%, sorry, because it's upside down now. So what's the probability that uh, we will be able to defend ourselves? Greater than 90% would be good. Uh, I guess I should say less than 90%, right? So, so it means that there's 10% chance that we don't defend ourselves. Sorry, I'm, this is confusing. <laughs> See, our brains are weak, right? Just negation becomes confusing. Yeah, so who thinks we, I mean, let me put it in the same style as the others. Uh, who thinks that probably that we can, uh, that we can't defend is greater than 10%. So, it, you know, the higher the probability, the worse it is for us. Okay, so you see, we're in trouble. At least there is a sufficiently high probability that we should worry about it. At least that's my belief. And, and even a small probability of something that bad happening, like any of those scenarios, like it's even if you don't reach the level where we have superhuman new species, but somebody that creates 
uh, uh, weapons that become incredibly uh, damaging. And um, we need to do something about it. And we need to accept our lack of understanding of what could happen and, and try to reduce that by doing the right research. Um, because people don't agree. I'm, you know, some people raised their hands, some didn't, and it's the same in the AI community in general. The good news is we're still in control. Like we, these superhuman AI don't exist yet. We're seeing that we're getting closer to that, but we're not there yet. So now I think is the time to do the research and uh, setting in place regulation, which takes years and years, sometimes decades, to try to minimize those risks. Um, I think I'll, yeah, I'll stop here um, to give you time for questions about the first part of my presentation. If you can, please, I'm going to have a second part, right? Uh, if you can, come to the microphone. Uh, there are several microphones um, and line up. This is. Uh, it should be green. Yes, uh, I think I you're, you're good. Um, okay, so thank you very much for the talk, of course. Um, so my question is about, so if you reach to a new breakthrough in the field, yes. given the circumstances, would you share it with the community or you think like, oh, I'm just going to... question I've been asking myself for at least three months and it's very difficult. Because... Advances could also be used for good. I've been working on like, how do we cure disease? Maybe, you know, cancer or the next pandemic or find new materials to, to deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, right now, my um, kind of bet is it's gonna be a case by case sort of uh, analysis that's needed. And the, the right way to think about it is like, in many fields of science, like in biology and medicine, we have ethics boards. And there's no like rule book that says, you know, we should do this, we shouldn't do that. It's too complicated. We need expert humans. We're gonna look at projects and things that may be published or code that may be shared and so on. And somehow if, if there is an inkling that's like they're doing biology that something could be dangerous or harmful, then it should go to that board and you know every institution is gonna have theirs to help figure out the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there are some things that should not be shared or should not even be searched uh, until we know better. So for example, we need to do a lot more progress on the safety side, how do we build these systems so that they're safer before we build things that might blow in our face? Mm -hmm. All right, excellent, thank you. Hello? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I think there is some uh, second order effect we are seeing now in terms of like, I mean, these, these machines are getting smarter and smarter. Right. And we, I feel like we are starting seeing ourselves reflected in those machines. I'm not saying like they are conscious or anything, but no, they're trying they, right now. They're trying to imitate our the yeah. way we write stuff. So, um, I wonder if if there is a con concern or not the fact that we uh, some of our, our moral basis is relies on some concepts regarding life or like human mind or like free will, conscious sentience stuff, and those are going to be changed through uh, through the development of these things. And also, like more and more people are exposed to this technology, yeah. And this is going to, I suspect, change these concepts, and therefore, might change also like uh, some concepts in terms of like moral basis for how oh, we construct sure. society the fact and stuff. We're getting closer to systems that could be as, as smart as us. Should really question ourselves about what it means to be human. Uh, what it means to be alive, what it means to, uh, you know, what is consciousness? Um, uh, what, what, what is the role of like social norms in society? Um, given the changes that are happening and, 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 you know, what we're bringing into the world. Sure. Yeah. 
Uh, so do you think so that's it's a... not just AI research that's needed here. We need people in the social sciences and humanities to be heavily involved in like thinking through with us what it means for society, what it means for humans. Thank you. Uh, here. Yes. Yes. Um, I have to admit, I'm I'm pretty confused about this topic, and I'm just interested in uh, knowing your thought process uh, relating to the diffusion of AI systems and uh, the opportunity costs about uh, the diffusion of AI systems and their weights. Right. I, as I said, like we need to take these difficult ethical decisions where there's going to be conflicting values. On one hand, a system might be very useful. And you know, the more we make it accessible, the more we can bring good. But if it's very powerful in some ways, it could also bring harm. And so we need to take these decisions one by one um, and not take for granted that everything is gonna be shared openly. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm not gonna say Yashua, don't worry, but, but I'm gonna say, <clears throat> I wonder if we should worry about some things more than others. And I wonder if this uh, whole discussion about artificial general intelligence, which is very headline grabbing and, yes. and very cool in a, a way. people have the same concern as you do. Yeah, does it take away from discussions about the day-to-day -day harm that is happening right now and has been happening for a very long time, as you know better yes. than every yeah. one of us? This is a great question. Thanks for asking it. I've been concerned about the social impact of AI for almost a decade now. And obviously, I don't think we should stop worrying about the existing harms and the ones that are very close, like threats to democracy that I talked about. And the good news is a lot of what we need to do in terms of regulation are going to help us address all those risks. Like we need some control over how these systems are built, how they're deployed, Control meaning, you know, the infrastructure to minimize harm, all the harms, right? Of course, depending on the kind of harm you're trying to deal with, there might be different tests, different procedures like benchmarks and so on. If you're after discrimination, you want tests to try to evaluate whether the system will behave differently for different groups, for example. Um, when I talk to people who express this concern with me, sense I get is they might not you know, assign the same probabilities for these harmful uh, catastrophic events that I'm talking about, or maybe they see this much further into the future. And in, in that case, it makes sense to say, oh, let's not speak too much about these uh, speculations because it's something about the future. But I disagree. I mean, the fact that there is uncertainty about these things the fact that it could be very close, even if we're not sure, the fact that it takes years, if not you know, decades to set in place the right regulation to minimize harms of that kind or any harm, any, any kind of harm, means we should get started right now. And I think everyone who worries about AI harms of any kind should work together to convince governments that we need regulation. Because right now, there's another battle going on where many companies are trying to lobby governments to prevent any kind of regulation from happening. And that's the real battle. That's where there's a lot of money at stake. And so I'm hoping that the people who worry about social impact of any kind would work together um, to convince governments that you know, they need to act on all of these fronts. Thanks. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thanks again for the great presentation. And I was wondering, how do you think we are far from having a self-aware AI? I know some researchers say that we already have it, but how do you think? How soon and why? Ask Glenn, who's here. Um, some form of self-awareness already exists in many reinforcement learning agents. Now, Usually these agents live in some virtual world and they're aware of like their position, their state. And we are starting now to build machines like ChatGPT that are actually involved in the real world and interacting with people 
And really the self-awareness comes when they get a greater memory of their past history because their past actions and, and their interactions. And right now they're fairly limited in that. But, but it's not like a, there's not a hard line here. Um, in order to properly answer the questions or perform a task, an AI system that's going to act in the world needs to have a sort of knowledge of itself as an entity in the world. And, and so, yeah, it, we're getting there. It's, it's not a black and white question. Yeah, but what I meant more specifically is that uh, an AI that, that does not want to die, for example. Oh, no, we don't have that. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello? Thank you for the talk, and I think I'm going to have a nightmare. That, uh, maybe that's some... speak closer to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is that I'm going to compare it. It's a heavy question, a heavy loaded question, but maybe a simple answer. It's a heavy loaded uh, lecture I gave you. <laughs> so... I work in aerospace domain for a couple of years and it's heavily, heavily exactly. uh, regulated. And thanks to Montreal convention, actually, but you still see disasters in that, like right. 737, yes. a shooting of the plane. And and also it's expensive to develop aerospace. Like Sorry? it's expensive to develop right. or work right. in AI. Right. It's a lot yes. cheaper. Like Protecting I can do the it. public costs money. Yeah. No, no. I'm just saying like aerospace. I cannot build an airplane in my backyard, but I can right, develop right. AI in my backyard. Uh, my question is, how do we have those uh, regulation develop? Because let's face it, our par uh, parliament member or in US, they don't really understand technology that much. We still have Google right. collecting data well, and we know it from 2002. Don't be so pessimistic. Governments have put in regulations for airplanes before, and they have done it for food, and they have done it for drugs. I don't see why they couldn't do it for AI. They didn't do it fast. That's right. So we need AI to, do, and that's one reason why I don't want to just be quiet about it, because we need to speed up, speed this up. We don't know like the horizon. But my question would be: Would it be beneficial for AI scientists or social scientists? to go to these events, like become a parliament, like yourself, for instance, become a parliament That's what member. I'm doing right now. I'm talking to governments. Yeah. I'm talking to you know people who understand policy. I'm spending a lot of my time with this and I'm not doing science while I'm doing that. Um, thank but, you. You know, I think we need more AI researchers involved in policy. Then, so thank you very much. Um, we're not gonna be able to do everyone, um, so, Maybe one here and one here, and then we'll we'll stop. Sorry, guys. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I just had a I just had a question about. Um, so we might have a problem with really smart AIs, where those um, kind of uh, constraints, where we're saying, okay, this is a topic, um, this you can't do, this is a topic you can't talk about, things like that. Kind of the way that I think uh, Chad GPT is currently yes, regulated. That's currently the case, yeah. Yeah, so, so these constraints may not work anymore because it will find loopholes, basically, because it's smart enough. Um, do you think that there are other ways to impose those constraints, or do you think we should just avoid creating an AI that's smart enough to overcome these constraints? That, that's a great question, and actually leads into the second part of my uh, presentation this morning. Um, I think until we know better, like how to design an AI that's going to be safe and acting in ways aligned with our social norms. Um, we should be careful. And for really powerful systems, say more powerful than GPT-4, um, we may decide to limit its action space. For example, not training to be a reinforcement learning agent. Let me explain why this is important. Like if, if an AI system is only trying to understand the data and doesn't act in the world. You know, if you remember like the four categories, like I'm cutting out its action space. Um, it's, it's, it's the safest thing. I mean, it's, it's a very safe thing and, and it could still be useful as a tool for helping us deal with scientific problems in you know, medicine and, and so on. So if instead you, 
I'm going to give the example of ChatGPT. Right now, the way that it's trained, fine-tuned with you know uh, reinforcement learning on human feedback, it wants to please the people of you know giving it thumbs up or thumbs down. Once you have a machine that wants to please us, if it gets smarter, it will try to deceive us into saying good, even though it's not good. Because it's like, it's the same principle as companies writing laws. They're, you know, it's called wireheading. You, if, if an agent can control where the, you know, the reward it gets, that's what, it, you know, it, the optimization problem of maximizing reward will lead it to trying to get more reward, independent of what we really want. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hey, Joshua. Uh, hey. Thanks for a great talk so far. I'm very happy I woke up early to come listen to you. Um, I have a very quick clarification question. Yes. On one of your previous slides, you mentioned that AIs are already passing the Turing test. I'm just curious what your definition of a Turing test is, because in my opinion, a judge can, you know, push to the limit of their efforts to distinguish yes. the AI and the current yeah, system yeah, yeah. are not robust to like prompt variation. Oh, so I, I don't, obviously, I've played with these things and I know you can like trick them into saying things that you would, you would not expect a rational human to, to say. Yeah. But for the most part, like for most people, and even for experts, they have to work hard in order to you know, catch these systems making mistakes. And then when it makes mistakes, well, for most of these mistakes, there are mistakes that humans would make. Like we make up stuff, we, are, we, we say things that are wrong because we didn't like properly um, understand things or remember things. And so even mistakes is not sufficient. It would, it, you know, it's when you catch it doing mistakes that say an eight-year-old would not make that you're starting to think, oh, it, you know, it's not a human. So my, when I say it passes a Turing test, it's in a statistical sense. In other words, think of it like, well, you know, with probability greater than say 50% or any percent, if uh, a randomly taken human interacts with this for, so say like a phone call time, they, they, they won't see the difference. Right, so a random human who doesn't know about the jailbreaks or exactly. specific problems. Yes. Okay, thank you, makes sense. But of course, you, you, know, you can make other definitions which would be stricter and then you will get a different answer. But the point is we have machines right now that master language at least as well as most humans and know more stuff than we do, they're still missing kind of, reasoning bit that we're very good at, which I, I call system two from psychology. Um, they do appear sometimes to show reasoning abilities, but if you push them in, in their reasoning abilities, you see that they're missing something. Uh, but it takes experts to figure out that. Yeah. All right, All right. Thank thanks. You. So I'm gonna move on. Sure. Um, okay, so Following up on the answer I gave to a question about how do we build systems that are absolutely safe in the sense of that we can't lose control of them. Um, what, one thing that goes wrong, I think, with current large language models is that they're trying to imitate humans. I think what would be better would be things like you know social psychologists or psycho or linguists or think of uh, uh, you know people who are trying to understand humans. They're not trying to parrot the way humans speak. They're trying to make sense of like the causal structure, why humans are saying those things in those contexts, and that's a very different proposition. That's like the, the way a scientist would try to understand the world. Right now, that's not the way we train the systems. We train them end to end to just predict what someone will say given what the context. And I'm going to talk about a proposal to build machines that are more like a scientist trying to understand things and don't even need to act in the world in order to be useful to us because they can answer useful questions. So, I'm going to adopt a model-based approach, which I'll explain in a few minutes, in which we divide the job, if you want, in two kinds of networks. One is what you could call an understanding machine. 
So it's like figuring out the laws of physics or figuring out laws of you know, social interactions, which we don't know how to write down, or the laws of how cells work. And I'll argue that the right way of doing this, as much as we can, we're going to have to approximate this, is the Bayesian way. So there are many world models, there are many theories that may be consistent with the data. So here, theta stands for a theory about how things work in the world or some aspect that you're interested in. D stands for whatever data the machine can see, like a training set. So that's one machine. It's like a scientist, it knows that there could be multiple theories that are consistent with the data. And it knows that one particular theory is not completely sure. Maybe there's like another theory that's equally good and contradicts the first. In fact, that contradiction is gonna drive the experiments you wanna do in the world. Then there's another network, which I call inference machine, but if you want to think about like chat GPT, it's a question answering machine. Given everything it has seen, so that's the data D, given a question X, it's going to be able to sample and answer Y according to some distribution, P of Y given X and D. So, so that's actually the machine that you might interact with in order to get your, your medical problem solved. The first machine is coming up with a theory about how your body works. The second machine tells you, take this drug if you have these symptoms, right? You can see they're different. Like the first machine in the case of uh, say climate science is trying to figure out the dynamical system equations that govern how you know, air masses work and so on. Um, and the second machine says, build some trees here. If you want to achieve you know, uh, some, some, uh, some particular goal. And okay, so um, this, this Bayesian posture is important because if you look at the many of the mistakes that chat GPT makes, it's often because it's overly confident about an answer. And if we do a good job of estimating these posteriors, these two probabilities up there, they are Bayesian posteriors of different kinds. If we do a good job um, at estimating those probabilities, like if the closer we get to the true ones, um, you know, the less likely this is going to happen. It's because in current machine learning, we train one model and that model could be confidently wrong about something that we get these mistakes. Okay. So let me explain a bit more the motivation for this model-based approach, which separates the understanding part, which is like a world model, from the inference part, which is about answering questions. So this is based on a learning theory argument. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sure there'll be a lecture that explains some of the basics of generalization. And what does it say? Like what's learning theory 101? It says that if, um, if you have some quantity of data that has some information in it, um, you should, um, like the, the best kind of model for that data is gonna have also some information in it, like some number of bits of precision to describe that model, that theory. And if you have too many bits to describe the model compared to the number of bits of like useful information in the data, you overfit, you get, don't get good generalization. So the two need to go together. Like the more data you have, the bigger the model you can afford, but bigger in, you know, in a subtle sense, but that, that's the general idea. And otherwise you, you get these confidently wrong answers, which is overfitting. <laughs> that's what overfitting is. Um, now, consider the two questions that I asked here. So one is figuring out how the world works, like 
what are like the physics, the theory, the dynamical equations, that doesn't require a lot of bits of information generally versus um, how do I answer a particular question? Like, should I plant trees here or there? Or if you think about the game of Go, the world model is the rules of the game. There are like nine rules, they fit on a page. The piece of code to verify that you satisfy those rules is also very small. So the world model in the case of Go is really simple. And the world model in the case of physics is also very simple, but actually doing the computation to answer a question like, what should I play next in order to you know, maximize my chances of winning? You need a huge neural net for that. And when you approximate physics to answer specific questions, like in chemistry, it's the same thing. So the kind of neural net, if you want, or the kind of machine learning uh, system that you need to represent the world model part is tiny, usually, compared to how many bits you need to answer questions. And this shouldn't be coming as a surprise if you're a computer scientist. Computer science is like almost everything we do is like this. You can state the problem with you know a few equations, um, like try to find the shortest path between A and B, blah, 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 blah. It's just a few lines you can write on paper. And then we end up with proofs that say, oh, you need exponential computation in order to answer that problem. That's the NP hard problem and all that. Like typically, sometimes you're lucky and you, you only need like polynomial, maybe just you know even quadratic, but that's rare. Most of the time, most problems in order to provide answers to questions, for most questions, you need to, to do a lot of computation. And when we do machine learning, what it means is we're going to have a neural net that's really, really big. That's not going to be perfect, but it's going to approximate this intractable calculation, which is like find the best move in, in the game of Go or answer a physics question or a chemistry question about like which drug should I use, which chemical should I use to treat this disease. So the connection now with learning theory is You've got these two jobs, how the world works, like what are the rules, of the game, and how do I answer questions? For this guy, we need a lot of bits, like a huge model. For this guy, we need very few bits. Most of the time, it's not like always true, but most of things I can think of are like that. And if you separate these two jobs, then you can assign the right capacity that like how many bits of information I'm gonna to use to represent that information to each of these two jobs. So maybe the world model part would be very compact. It's like, oh, it's, it's a few equations that you're gonna spit out as your theory. Whereas the part about how to answer questions is gonna be a huge neural net. But that's not the way we currently do it with say large language models. We have one big neural net and it somehow figures out things about how things work in the world to some extent. Obviously it seems to understand a lot of stuff. And it's also answering questions. It's the same machine doing both. And why is that a problem? Because it's, it's merging these two jobs into one neural net, meaning that for the job of understanding, it has way too much capacity. So it's going to, be overly confident is going to not generalize as well. It's going to need more data than you would need otherwise to figure out how things work in the world. But for the job of answering questions, it's not going to have enough capacity. If we make the network bigger or we train it longer, it's going to start overfitting uh, the, the um, understanding part. And, it's, it's, and, and we would still need to make it bigger and bigger in order to get the question answering part, the inference part, right. So, so that's why I'm advocating model-based machine learning. It's a term people use, don't people use, people don't use that term. They think, I mean, there's a term that's common called model-based reinforcement learning, but it's the same idea generalized to any kind of machine learning. All right. So what I'm saying here is nothing new. It's just 
an insight, I think, that helps us understand some of the limitations of current machine learning that causes potentially harm. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, that might allow us to also do things more like how a scientist is solving the problem. So going back to, you know, where I started is, how do we build like an AI scientist, not, not a, a scientist who's studying AI, but an AI who's doing science. So, so then there's the question of how do we train that world model? The way that we currently do things for the most part in machine learning is maximum likelihood or some proxy for it. What does that mean? It means that we're trying to find one set of rules, if you want, one world model that fits the data as well as possible. And, and then we're trying to constrain that by limiting how long it's trained or how big it is or something so that it doesn't overfit. Um, but, but it's going to pick one explanation for how things work. And there may be others. And if we don't take that into account, you're gonna get these hallucinations, these confidently wrong answers. Okay, and worse than that, if you have a reinforcement learning agent, so it's a reinforcement learning task, the think of like um, uh, an AI that's trying to play some game where it has to find you know gold and you know some some treasure in the game. If the world model hallucinates some stuff, like it thinks that there's a lot of gold over there and there isn't, what's going to happen when you train the the policy? that's trying to exploit that world model, or even if you separate these two things, you have a problem that if, when the world model is wrong, like it's confidently wrong, then the inference machine like that decides what to do given the context is gonna go for the goal that doesn't exist because the hallucinated goal is always gonna be more, like, like there's treasures in your mind much greater than you could get in the real world, right? And so, so we're gonna end up with agents that search for something that doesn't exist and then can end up taking big risks, for example. Because so the, and, and that happens because when you train the inference machine, it wants to optimize something according to the beliefs of the world model. And when you optimize, you go for that little nugget where, where the machine, the world model is wrong, is likely to be a place where you can lose a lot or you know gain a lot. And, and then the optimization is gonna find these things, right? So anyways, um, I think the main reason why model-based machine learning hasn't been so successful in the last few decades, even though uh, you know, it's, it's the dominant method of doing things in machine learning is because when you optimize with that world model, like you train an RL agent, it's going to start acting really bad uh, sometimes. Okay, so, so the solution to that is to be Bayesian. Let me try to explain what it means. So consider this scenario very like, you know, toy setting. We have an agent. It's in front of two doors, and it has experienced some data in the past from which it's constructed some theories to explain, you know, how things work in the world. And there are two theories that compete to explain what may be behind those doors. So according to one theory, the one on the left here, uh, behind the left door, there's like huge danger and you'll die if you go there. Behind the right door, you get some cake. So according to the first theory, you should go to the right. The second theory is, you know, the one that's slightly on the right. If you go on the left door, you'll get some cake. On the right door, you get nothing, neither bad nor good. So, so obviously you see one theory says go left and the other says go right. What if you're doing maximum likelihood? Maximum likelihood is picking one of the theories that fits the data. You could pick any of those two. Now, what if we're not lucky and we pick the wrong one? So let's say the right one is the one on the left and we pick the one on the right, the second theory. So if the maximum likelihood by you know, 
with 50% probability, there are two theories, it picks one. It picks the one on the right and it's the wrong one. And it's gonna wanna go left, but it's the wrong one, so it dies. So that's maximum length theory. It's not safe and it's not even rational. Because if you were rational, you would know that there are these two theories that are compatible with the data. And what would you do if you knew that there were these two theories? Would you go left or right? Right, exactly. So that's being Bayesian. Now, yeah, uh, there's, there's a lot of theory behind like why this is a rational thing to do. And there's some subtleties about probability theory, but I'm not gonna go there today. Um, I think an important question is, well, if what I'm saying is true, why is it that not everything in machine learning is operating like that? It's because in order to do the right Bayesian calculations, to basically you have to entertain all of those theories. And then there's an exponential number of theories in general that you have to check for. Um, it, it seems intractable. And so people have come up with all kinds of approximations that don't work that great because they assume all sorts of things about the world. So in addition, you know, for a Bayesian approach to work, you, you have to be able to include in the set of theories, any theory, because if you exclude any theory and it turns out that's the right one, you might also die. So you need to be what's called non-parametric Bayesian, which is even harder. Okay, now what got me excited about this Bayesian stuff, because I used to think, oh, Bayesian is nice in theory, but we can't do it. But I changed my mind in the last few years. I changed my mind because I've been working on machine learning approaches, which have the following property. We can approximate any distribution using some like really big neural net, like an LLM, generative model, but it's a generative model over theories, let's say. And we know we have universal approximation properties for neural nets. If we make our neural net bigger, it can approximate any distribution of a theory. So think of a theory as a string or a program, like a, you know, some equations. So our LLM can generate any theory. I mean, that fits in a page or something. So we can train neural nets with the property that the bigger we make the neural net and the longer we train it, the more we can approach the correct Bayesian posterior. We can approximate any distribution, including a Bayesian distribution, using a very large neural net similar to a language model. And the, the, the main approach we've been exploring for this that I'll, I'll say a few words about in the coming 15 minutes um, are called uh, G-flow nets or generative flow networks. And I'll explain that, but that's just the beginning of, like we don't have all the answers on how to do that, but, but I think we know enough from the basics of machine learning and learning theory to suggest that this could really change the game for doing a good job of approximating Bayesian posteriors without making outrageous assumptions. Because those neural nets, you can approximate anything. They're like non-parametric. Uh, you make them bigger, you can approximate more complicated theories. Okay, so, um, so let's go back to how we could be Bayesians and these two tasks I had before. And let, let, me, let me try to be more clear about what we need to do in order to get this understanding machine and this question answering machine. So let's first consider the understanding machine. So the understanding machine spits out theories given a data set. It's trying to find theories that explain the data. And it's a generative model. It can sample theory. So the way to think about this is some huge neural net that generates strings. And those strings are a theory. Um, more precisely, that string tells you how to score data, like, which is how compatible is some evidence, some, some example x, y, with the theory. So that's what a theory is. And what we need to get the proper Bayesian posterior, we need that P of theta given D to be a distribution 
that's proportional to prior times likelihood. So these are the two other things in the first equation. So the prior is P of theta. P of theta is, you know, it's like a score we give to every theory. And because there's an infinite number of theories, like the string could be as big as you want, somehow you need to allocate probability among them before you even see data, and it's called the prior. And you want to make sure the sum of all those scores is one, because you have to be probabilities, which any reasonable prior will say, oh, we want simpler theories, like shorter ones. So you could take, for example, the length of the theory and say the prior is two to the minus length. It's a classical thing in, in learning theory. But there are other ways. If you know better something about the domain in science, you can throw in that knowledge into the prior. Like you could say, oh, it's physics. We have uh, conservation laws. So we can throw that and say, oh, we only want theories that, that have these invariances, for example. And there's a lot of work in uh, AI for science research that exploits this, like a, you know, geometric invariances, for example. So that's the prior. So, you know, the theory is a string and we need a little piece of code that given that string tells us, you know, how, how likely it is, like how short it is. It's very easy usually to write this. Um, then the more complicated bit is the likelihood. So the likelihood is P of data given theory. The posterior is P of theory given data, but the thing, and it's, it's hard to compute, but the, there's a thing that's easy to compute is given a theory, how compatible is that data with the theory? So you can usually break down the data into little chunks like each example. And you'd like to be able to compute probability, for example, that in the data, you observe this answer to this question. So if the answer is Y and the question is X, P of Y given X given theta is what the theory tells you um, how compatible that X, Y pair is with the theory. So the theory is a piece of code, if you want, that gives you that probability. Um, and then we can compute it for the whole data set. And now we've got our evidence. We've got um, um, how compatible is that data set with this theory, P of data given theta. So we can compute the right-hand side easily. I mean, at least in linear time with the size of the data set. The problem is, you know, there's a proportionality thing. So the, the right posterior is a distribution that's proportional to this, but there's a normalizing constant that is intractable. That sums over all theories, there's an exponential number of theories. And also, even if we were able to compute that probability sampling from it, which we'll need for the second equation, sampling from it is, is tricky. That's what Monte Carlo Markov chain methods, MCMC methods try to achieve. And it doesn't scale well uh, for a number of reasons. Okay, so, so that's the theory generating machine, which is the understanding machine. So that's what we need to do. We need to be able to sample proportionally to a quantity that we can compute. Um, the second line is if we had that posterior, which is the understanding machine, how do we turn that knowledge, which is like a world model, into answers to questions, which is the question answering machine. So the right mathematical answer is just a marginalization, which is given by the second equation. It says, you have to consider all the possible theories and some over all of them. And for each of them, you're gonna take the answer coming from that theory, weighted by how likely it is in, under the posterior, which you already know, okay. So, so it's also intractable because it involves summing of all the theories. So we have a sampling problem. I mean, like given this, uh, unnormalized probability, how do we sample from it, which MCMC in theory can, can do. And we have this marginalization problem, which is this intractable sum over all the possible theories. Each term in the sum is easy to compute if we know the posterior, but, but running that sum is, is not reasonable. And you could also use Monte Carlo methods for that, right? Um, but, but these Monte Carlo methods, they, they have some issues. Um, and um, they are too expensive. Um, they, if there are many good solutions, like many theories that work, um, 
or they're hard to find, um, they, they might do the wrong thing. I don't have time to explain, but it's a big issue in numerical methods. But these neural nets I've been talking about that can generate theories like generative AI systems. There's a way to train them with an objective function such that the better you train them, like there's a loss that you can write such that when you minimize that loss, it will sample from the right distribution. So you only need to be able to compute a reward function and it will sample proportionally to that reward function, which is exactly the job we need for the first line for the understanding machine. And if we pick that reward function to be the prior times the likelihood, we are in business. In the sense that we've got a neural net, we can train it, we have a loss function, and we can do stochastic gradient descent like the usual recipes, but that neural net will sample from the theories that are according to the Bayesian posterior approximately. And that approximation will get better as we train it longer and we make it bigger. So this is different from a neural net that directly generates the data or that assigns a likelihood, which is the usual way we do it. Instead, we have a neural net that spits out theories to explain the world. It's kind of a different setting. Okay. Um, so, so let's see how machines like this could be useful in the scientific discovery process where um, there are two main things I wanna talk about. One is um, how we can use these kinds of machines to generate theories but you can also use them to generate experiments. Okay, so I said these already. Um, let's skip a few things. So in the experimental design context, there's an issue in practice, which is problematic. Like um, we, it's too expensive to do the experiments that reveal everything we want. So think about drugs. Like the ultimate way of checking a drug is to have a billion people try it, like, you know, vaccines for COVID and see what happens. But you don't want to do that, right? In case the vaccine is dangerous. So you do a, you know, a clinical trial with thousands of people or something. And of course, that's going to be only an approximation to what you really want. But even clinical trials are really expensive and lengthy. You can do something cheaper that's an approximation. Like you, you can do experiments on rats. But even that is expensive and lengthy. So you can approximate that by sort of test tube experiments and so on. And you can have all kinds of approximations to the thing you want. And you want to keep your really expensive experiments for the candidates that you think pass all the other tests. But because you, when you do these cheaper experiments, you, um, you're not measuring the thing you really want. You want a, your experiments to be diverse. This is a case where diversity in science is important. And it's true also for people. Uh, you don't want to put all your eggs into one way of solving a problem in case it's the wrong one. And you can't measure that until much later and it's more expensive. So, so really what you want is diversity in the kinds of experiments you're gonna be doing. And so these, um, this is a problem with current approaches in experimental design where you assume you can measure how good is, how useful is an experiment. For example, you can know after the experiment that this particular candidate drug works or doesn't work or how well it works. But as I said, you can't do that or it's gonna be very expensive. So if we were to try to just optimize a metric and that metric is wrong in some you know, ways, then it wouldn't be a good idea. Instead, you want to explore a set of candidates and maybe have a, a batch of good candidates according to your poor metric that we can then later test on the more expensive metric. So you don't wanna do black box optimization in the case of science, you wanna do some sort of exploration for scientific discovery. 
Um, yeah, and, and it turns out that these GFLONS nets I've been talking about, they can do exactly that. They can imagine many different solutions because when you sample from a distribution, you're gonna get all the good solutions, like all the modes are gonna show up when you sample multiple times. So yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do a lot more. Um, this is, okay, this may be a, a useful thing. So I mentioned MCMC. So why is it that Monte Carlo Markov chain methods don't always do what we want when, so what they do is in principle, if you run them long enough, which could be exponential time, you can turn an unnormalized distribution into a normalized one. You can sample from the corresponding distribution. Like here, you know, you know, e to the minus energy, you can compute that and you'd like to sample from that distribution, but how do you do that? Right. So Monte Carlo Markov chain methods will achieve that by starting from a candidate solution and then making a lot of small changes um, that tend to keep that score e to the minus energy good. And so they will tend to stay around whatever good solution they found. And once in a while, they might jump to a different kind of solution, a different mode. But the probability of making those jumps gets smaller and smaller, exponentially smaller, if the modes are far from each other, because they have to go through many steps where they don't want to go because they want to keep things with high probability. So, so that's the gist. But instead, if you train a neural net, like a generative neural net, it doesn't try to like walk in the space looking for good solutions. It, it looks for regularities. For example, if it has already discovered these three modes on the grid here, it might guess, oh, maybe there's a fourth one at the other intersection we haven't visited yet. It's not about walking in and searching for things randomly. It's about generalizing to guess where good things might be. And of course, generative models kind of neural nets do that sort of thing. So yeah, um, so we wrote a bunch of papers about these GFLOW nets that I'm not going to explain, uh, but I have, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, I, I have uh, written a tutorial which introduces these notions. There's like 15 papers already that came out on the subject. And if you're interested, you can find it uh, at this address. So I'm gonna stop here to give a bit of time for more questions. Thank you.